One thing that uh, I think that we can probably find in just about every home that we pass by today is a Christmas tree. Uh, one way or another, uh, everybody has got a tree and usually decorated with lights and ornaments, but uh, there's one decoration that stands out from all the rest because it sits on the top of the tree and all by itself, it's called the tree topper. And so uh, uh, with all kinds of, there's all kinds of tree toppers out there and here's just a little sampling of them right there. I kind of like the Star Trek one, and maybe you uh, like one of those other ones too. But, uh, you know, you could Google that this afternoon, and you could find many, many more different kinds of tree toppers. Uh, that's just a sample. The sky is the limit. And, and so those are just a few of many, many different kinds of them that you can buy. And, but you know, you know, I want to take a guess at what you think are the two uh, most popular tree toppers out there. What do you think are the most popular tree toppers on our Christmas tree? Let's hear. Anybody want to take a guess at that? Angels. Sounds like you're talking in tongues, but I think I heard mostly stars and angels. angels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you're right. Um, uh, and so, um, now why... Why would they be on the tree? <laughs> well, obviously, because they're, they're really a major part of the uh, biblical story of Christmas. The angels announced the birth of Christ to the shepherds, and the star uh, led the wise men to Jesus. Okay, but today I want to focus on just one of those tree toppers. I want to talk about the star, the star of Bethlehem. And this week, uh, you know, we're going to celebrate the big day. We're going to celebrate the anniversary of Jesus' birthday, uh, Christmas Day. Uh, through this month of December, we've been on a journey following the star that guides us to Jesus and the gifts that he brings into our life, gifts like hope, gifts like joy, gifts like love and, and uh, peace. And these are the things that um, we all desire in some measure, and they tie in with the salvation that Jesus brings. As it did so long ago for the wise men, so the star does the same for us pointing us and directing us, guiding us towards Jesus. And today, we're going to be following the star to Christmas. It's kind of amazing that God chose a star, a star to guide the wise men to Bethlehem. And, and throughout the Bible, really, uh, we see how God uses his own creation to reveal himself to us. The psalmist put it beautifully in Psalm 19. I love Psalm 19, which says, the heavens, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voices, their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And then even in Psalms chapter 8, uh, verses 3 and 4 says, when, you, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, David speaking about God and his creative work, when I speak of the heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you, that you care for them. God's glory is seen in the stars. And God has placed each one of the stars into the sky where there was only darkness at one time. Now there is this, this gleaming, glittering light. Our creator knows each of those lights. He does. And he even knows them by name. He knows which ones humans will eventually kind of try to connect with an invisible line uh, uh, into constellations like we see the Big Dipper or, or one of the other constellations. He knows which ones will burn out and, and when they're going to burn out and, and which ones will streak across the sky uh, like a falling star. And God knew the one star that would one day pulse and glow and serve as a beacon to lead and direct seekers from afar to his newly arrived son, Jesus. Yeah, this star would pierce the darkness with a unique purpose. It would signal the birth of Christ, the coming of the long-promised Messiah, who in the fullness of time, at just the right time, think about that, 
God sent forth his son. He came to earth to change the course of eternity forever. When you look at the stars in the nighttime sky, or when you see the twinkling lights of, a Chris, uh, of Christmas around town, or, uh, maybe outside somebody's lights, or maybe in your own Christmas tree this, this year, uh, in the next few days, I want you to let the star lead you to Christmas. I want you to remember that song by Sidewalk, Sidewalk Prophets, uh, Don't Forget the Star. Yeah, we're going to play that as we uh, uh, conclude here today. Um, Don't Forget the Star. The story of the star only occurs in, uh, in Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew 2, we're told that the, that the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And then uh, in Matthew 2, verses 9 to 11, we're told that the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented, to, presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, scholars, have, they disagree about what type of star this was. Some believe that maybe it was just a meteor. Or uh, others have thought that maybe it was a comet. Still others have speculated that the star was maybe uh, a supernova, uh, which was just a, an exploding star. Another explanation, though, for what created the light in the sky is that the star was uh, three planets aligning themselves together, that of uh, Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. And uh, it, it could have happened that way. In fact, uh, as I mentioned, I think last week, uh, tomorrow, the 21st, uh, there will be a, a, a realigning of Jupiter and Saturn, and we will be able to see uh, a, a bright star. Who knows whether that was the exact one? It hasn't happened where those two are aligned and this close to the Earth since 1623. So this is going to be a pretty big event. Uh, it's not going to happen for a long, long time after this again. But what we know for sure is that there was a star, yeah. And it led the wise men to the place where Jesus was. And we also know that this star was unlike any, of the, any that the wise men had ever seen before. These were men who had studied the stars. They knew the stars by name, and, and they knew which constellations had uh, what stars in them. But this star, this star was different. This star didn't belong. This star had a radiance all of its own, and the Magi knew it had to be something special. And this star drew them to worship the king. Now, what does the star leading to Christ and Christmas tell us about Jesus? That's what I want to consider today. The first thing that I want us to think about is that the Christmas star tells us that Jesus is glorious. Yeah, in Luke 2, 9, we, re we read, uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. You know, all throughout the Bible, we find light, and we've talked a lot about that, light associated with God's glory. And it was the light that God led the way for his people to come out of Egypt and make their way to the promised land. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 13, 21, that by day the Lord went ahead of them in what? In a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or by night. And when, and when God called Moses uh, near to him to come up on Mount Sinai to receive the law, God's people saw the glory of God uh, like, a, like a radiant light again. Exodus 24, uh, 15 through 17 tells us, When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called Moses from within the cloud. See, even when Moses came down, the people saw the, the glory of the Lord on his face because he was in the presence of the Lord. And so the Israelites, uh, to the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. 
And then Jesus, when he was transfigured uh, 1,400 years later in the presence of uh, uh, James and John and Pe uh, Peter, the Bible says in Matthew 17, 2, that Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. You know, that doesn't surprise me, and why not? Hebrews 1 tells us that Jesus was, the, was the, the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And so that doesn't surprise us. And in Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, Jesus says of himself, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Yeah. The star of Christmas testifies to the glory of Jesus. And it points us towards him to give him our worship. The Apostle John speaks of Christ's glory in, uh, in, first, in John 1, uh, verses 4 and 5, when he writes this. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You know, I heard this about a family that uh, loved Christmas and they especially loved decorating uh, uh, for, for Christmas. And whenever they decorated a tree, the final touch of pride for them was a, a star ornament that, that, that lit up. And then one year when they were decorating their tree, they placed the star on it, but the star didn't light up. Like, like it used to. And so the family was sad about that. They, they said, uh, but, but since it no longer uh, lit up, they removed it and they stuffed it in a box and somewhere uh, out of sight. Well, after a few years, the star became only a memory and now it had no place or part in the celebration of Jesus. But when the Christmas, uh, but, but then one Christmas, the father picked it up from the box and he, he fixed that light. And the family was delighted, and once again, it became the, the cherished decoration on their Christmas tree in celebration of the Savior. That story, that story reminds me that Jesus is glorious. He is. He is light. And we must allow his power to reflect in us so that God's glory can shine through and bring joy and, and, and meaning to others. Again, in John chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, uh, John writes this, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was, the, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to, what, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here's the question. Are you allowing God's glory to be reflected through you as, as uh, his light uh, uh, has, has his light gone out in you, even maybe during this, this time of COVID? You know, God wants to use each of us as instruments of his glory and grace, but are we willing to do that? Are we willing to acknowledge him and recognize Jesus as the light of the world who takes away our guilt, who takes away our sin, so that we can reflect his glorious good nature? What does, what does his glory look like that we might reflect it in our life? Well, it looks like love and it looks like joy and it looks like peace and it, it looks like what we've talked about the last three weeks. It looks like patience. It looks like kindness. It looks like goodness. It looks like faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Jesus is glorious and these are the ways that we can reflect him in, in our life. The second thing that the, that the uh, star that leads us to Jesus reminds us of is that Jesus will guide our life. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know, you might wonder, well, how, how does that work? How do I follow Jesus today? How do I follow Jesus today? You know, contained in this book right here 
Yeah, the Bible is God's message to you. It's his love letter to you. It really is to every one of us. But it can show you how you can flourish in life. If we do the actions that we read in, in that book, you know what? Um, we will be shining as, as God intended for us and, and using his light uh, as, he, as he intended. Sometimes we're like, you know, how does God, how come God's letting me go through this? Or why is my life always full of, of problems? I want to see, I want to see things go more smoothly. Well, you know, I think we go back to this book, and I think there's something very simple here in Psalm 119, verse 105, where David says, your word, he says, God, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He will guide our lives. The magi, the wise men, were men obviously acquainted with all the messianic prophecies about Jesus, Jesus' coming, which, which by this time had reached far, off, far away places, and they had faith in them. They were men who knew something about God's holy scriptures and the message within it, and, and they had faith in it. They allowed God to guide them. They read God's word, and they surrendered their personal plans to be a part of God's plan. They sacrificed. Think about that. In the search of the star as it led them, they sacrificed time, they sacrificed energy, they sacrificed personal uh, resources to make their way to worship him in all of his glory and to be guided by him. Well, there's one more thing that the star tells us that leads us to Christmas. And that is that the Christmas star tells us, I am somebody. I am somebody. Counselors today advise us to develop a positive self-image and self-worth. They insist, you are important. There's no one like you. You have a unique set of fingerprints. You are special. And that's true. We are. Parents go a little bit farther sometimes because they tell their children, well, uh, you know what? You can be anything you want to be because you are somebody. Well, that may not always be true because look at this example. If Shaquille O'Neal's mother told him, you know, you can be a jockey and you can win the Kentucky Derby someday, that wouldn't be true because he's seven foot one and 325 four pounds and, uh, you know, he's going to weigh his horse down. Um, oh, but you know what? If Pat Day, uh, Pat Day is a renowned jockey who's, I think, won four or five Kentucky Derbies, six or seven, uh, and, and his parents told him, you know what, you can be a center for uh, one of the basketball teams on the National Basketball Association someday. You know, that really wouldn't be very realistic because Pat Day is only four, four feet, 11 inches, and uh, barely 100 pounds in weight. Yeah. Let's face it, sometimes we don't feel very important. I'm thinking of this story about a mom preparing for a large Christmas Eve gathering, and I can kind of picture somebody like this. And she had been giving out orders like a drill sergeant to her little uh, preschool child, her, her little girl. Pick up your things. Don't get your clothes dirty. Put your toys away. Well, her four-year-old daughter had been underfoot all day, and so she sent her to the next room to play with, the, with their wooden nativity set. And as the mother was going about her other tasks, scurrying around, setting the table, she overheard her daughter talking to her toys in the same tone of voice that she had been talking to her. And she overheard her say, I don't care who you are, get those camels out of my living room. <laughs> well, sometimes we just feel like we get pushed around, don't we? Here's an unpleasant truth. Apart from God, you know, I am not very important. I don't really matter much at all. I'm just one in six billion people temporarily living and alive on this planet, which we call Earth, a, a tiny blue dot on, in God's great vast universe. I may live to be 80 or even
even 100 years old, and then I'm going to die, and my body will return to the dust to the ground. Very few, few people will notice uh, when I'm gone, and, and uh, there'll be a few people who love me, and maybe they'll even cry at my funeral, and they'll talk about me. Maybe they'll say I was a nice person, or maybe a decent fisherman, or a few other clowny things, you know, and, and how much they will miss me, and, and then they'll go back to the church building, and they'll have some ham and they'll have some potato chips and and they'll tell jokes about me and laugh and go on without me. A hundred years from now, you know what? Chances are most of our names won't even be spoke again on this place called earth. In James 4.14, the Bible says, what is your life? You are just a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. But when the light of Jesus enters our life, we have a divine calling and and an eternal purpose. He not only forgives our sins through his atoning sacrifice on the cross, but he also transforms us from being nobodies to being children of the creator of the universe. Think about that. Listen again to John, 1 John 3, 1, where, where John says, uh, how great is the love the Father has, has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is who we are. In 2005, there was an auction in London for a tooth. Yeah, I said a tooth. A tooth that went up for sale. And somebody bought that tooth for $22,600. And if you're like me, you're thinking, wow, you know, I only got a couple quarters when I put my tooth under my pillow at night, so what's the big deal? Who would pay all that money for a yucky old tooth? Well, it turns out that the tooth was pulled from the mouth of none other than Napoleon Bonaparte. And during Napoleon's exile in 1819, and the auction officials displayed papers that traced the tooth all the way back to the dentist that pulled it out. Now listen, what made the, the, that tooth valuable was to whom it was connected. We're not of much value on our own. That's why Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But when we're connected to Christ through faith and baptism, we become a part of the body of Christ. We have external significance because we have been adopted into the family of God. It's who we're connected to. We've also been entrusted with the the crucial assignment of taking the gospel to the world. We become somebody important, not because of who we are, but because of to whom we belong. Are you with me? So one of the joys of Christmas is the star's reminder that, like the the first century wise men, we matter to the God of the universe. And I love the way Peter said it, the way he stated it, in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, where he said, you are a chosen people. That's us. He said, you are a royal priesthood of servants of God. That's us. He said, you're a holy nation of people belonging to God, that's us. A special possession, that's us. That we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We matter. We matter to the God of the universe so much that he gave Jesus to die for us. The light of the world, of the world so that we could be light to the world today. I'm going to ask that you pray with me, and I've got some more things to say, one more thing to say after our prayer, though. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that Jesus is the light of the world, that we don't really matter. Uh, We would be nothing without you. We can do nothing without you as a part of our life. And there may be somebody here or somebody online watching it today that uh, needs your light. They need to know and they need to understand that you really are uh, concerned about us. We matter to you. 
You love us and you loved us so much that you sent Jesus. And that's what, that's what this story is all about that we're celebrating this week. His birth and his purpose for coming was for us and our salvation. And now you've called us while we have a few, few moments left here on this earth that you want us to be your light in our dark world. Lord, I, I just pray that you'll help us to see the light today. Lord, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that uh, Jesus let, light, lighted, lit the way for us. Lord, thank you. I, I pray that we'll take to heart what we've heard today when we realize when we celebrate Jesus' birth again this week that you have called us now to be your light in our dark world. Thank you, Lord, for these things. I, I pray that you'll help us to appreciate and have a greater love and, and, a, and appreciation for your story, your love story to us and what you did for us by sending Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This week I was reminded of the uh, song by Casting Crowns that's out right now called uh, Make Room in Your Heart. Maybe you've heard it. It's, uh, it's really neat because the song tells about Jesus' birth it talks about Jesus' birth and why God sent Jesus. And then the chorus says this, Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? You can come as you are, but it may set you apart when you make room in your heart. And trade your dreams for his glory. Make room in your heart. Make room in your heart. Make room in your heart today. Boy, if there's something that we need here, every one of us, maybe we need to redo that today. Make room in your heart today for him. If you've never made Jesus and given him the room in your heart that he deserves and wants um, to be on the throne of your heart, you know, I'm going to encourage you to do that even today, to make him your personal Lord and Savior, Savior and Lord, turning from sin and turning to God, confessing as who he is our Lord and Savior, and being baptized to have our sins washed away and God's Spirit to live within us. If you need to do that, I want to encourage you to do that today. Make room in your heart today.